Okay, I think we're going to start. We're going to let people uh, trickle in as they come in and uh, find themselves a good seat. But this is a this is going to be an interesting program, a fun program. So I want to get it get moving. My name is Tom Evenson. I want to thank you for coming today. I think you're going to find that it's worth it. A good investment of of a little bit of your time. Um, I get, I'm the Dean of the College of Public Affairs and Community Service, and this is a college that is filled with students and filled with faculty that are, are pretty passionate about what they're doing. Different areas, but all have to do with people and about making communities stronger. And this is a, uh, this is a time that we take out. This is the, what we refer to as the fall form. We say, let's give people a different kind of learning experience. And, um, outside the classroom. So let them come out and, and put them in a big room and uh, interact with each other and hear about people that are out there doing, working with people whose, whose boots are on the ground, so to speak. And, uh, and then bring that, take that out of here, just pretty intense kind of a, a morning or hour, and then do something with it. Make some, make some kind of difference. And that's the whole point behind the forms is, Let's learn in a little different way. We've had different topics at the fall forums, all the way from um, hunger to illiteracy to sex trafficking to bullying and international torture. And today we're dealing with an issue that you guys, or at least some of you identified as a uh, topic that you wanted to hear more about, you wanted to learn more about, discuss, act on. And that is the, and what came out at the top of the list was mental illness. And it certainly is a timely issue. We've been hearing a lot about it. And people are struggling with how do we handle that? How do we deal with that problem? That's what, that's what our college is about, social and community problems and solving them. We're not running away from them, but solving them. How can we? And that's what part of today is. You can, you're going to hear some, from some pretty impressive people who are handling them, who are moving forward in this area. But they also need us. They need you in particular to throw in your ideas and to give your thoughts and study to how can we do it even better. And so that's what we're, gonna, we're going to have our panel today uh, and, and stimulate some of that thinking on your part. That's the whole purpose here. I, uh, I want to give a warm UNT and PAX welcome to our panelists. I, uh, I want to point out that uh, uh, Representative Garnett Coleman got up very early this morning to take a plane to come in here and, uh, and, and join us. So we thank you and uh, uh, <clears throat> appreciate the fact that all of you are, um, are uh, working with us on this panel. You're going to get a chance to visit with these folks at, at lunch if, you, uh, if you're interested and uh, get to know them personally. You, their bios are in your, your program. Um, but I'm not going to take your time and introduce them. I'm going to let uh, turn that job over to our moderator, uh, Benet. I know her as Benet. Benet um, <laughs> Rogers. Yeah. I, okay. I'm sorry, Benet. I, I I work with her on and uh, at Contact. She's the executive chief executive uh, officer of Contact, the crisis center. And she is phenomenal at the, at the kind of work that she does. And she has agreed to be our moderator and introduce our panelists. And uh, we couldn't do better than, than the folks that we have and the moderator that we do have. So, Benet, I turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. We've got a short amount of time with you today, so we are going to, again, as Tom said, get, give our panelists an opportunity to speak with you and answer a few questions uh, here on the panel. But then afterwards, of course, they've all agreed to stay around. So that if there are additional questions, you have the opportunity to talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. But we are joined by some great folks today. And, and our purpose today is we want to educate you about what you need to know on a personal and professional level about mental illness. We also wanna talk a little bit about what you need to understand on how to erase the stigma, as well how you can make a difference on your campus, in your local communities, and also as you lead in your future lives or in your current lives legislatively. We want you to know how you can get involved. But we're gonna start with a couple of our panelists who really have just amazing personal stories about what brought them to 
being passionate about this issue of mental illness and suicide prevention. And I'm gonna start with Benita Halliburton. She is the president of the Grant Halliburton Foundation in the name of her son, who lost his life to a diagnosis of bipolar, but ultimately completed a suicide. So Benita, tell us a little bit, um, if you take a couple of minutes to tell us about your story. Well, my story may be very brief. I'm battling a little laryngitis, so I'll keep going, and those of you who can read lips can follow after that. Um, <clears throat> before Grant Halliburton Foundation was a foundation, Grant Halliburton was a boy. He was a boy who loved life more than anything. He was one of those kinds of kids who was very creative, gifted in art and music, had his own band, and had recorded a CD by the time he was 16. Um, just well liked in high school, voted coolest kid on campus. From the outside, he seemed like a young man who had it all. But there is more than one side to every story, and there's another side to Grant's story too. When he was 14, just in eighth grade, we learned from a friend of his going to the school counselor that he was cutting. And I have to admit at the time, we didn't even know what the counselor was talking about, cutting. He loved school because that's where all the people were, so we knew he wasn't cutting classes. Of course, we quickly learned that she was talking about a kind of self-injury that's linked to deep emotional pain. And for the next five years, we got Grant the help that he needed to fight his depression and ultimately bipolar disorder. But the other side of that very successful, outgoing, funny, creative guy was a young man who was hurting deeply inside, and no one could see it. And like many teenagers, many young people, he was very good at showing the outside world what they needed to see to be assured that everything was really okay. Because I believe he thought, like most many people do, it was not okay to show that side. It was not okay to let it be known that he was suffering and struggling and hurting. He needed to put that face up, that mask, wear that mask all the time. Grant was offered scholarships to all the top art schools in the country. He ultimately chose to go to UT Austin. But he came home early in his freshman year and one day said, Mom, I need help. We helped him to check into the psychiatric unit of a hospital here in Dallas where he stayed for 30 days. He never once asked to leave. He wanted more than anything to be whole and to be well and to be rid of deep emotional pain that he felt inside. Two weeks out of the hospital, I thought, really, he's acting so differently, I don't understand what I'm seeing. He had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder one with psychosis while he was in the hospital. But just so many changes had taken place and his behavior seemed odd to me. I just didn't know what I was looking at because two weeks out of the hospital, he took his own life. Now, I will never know why, exactly why, Grant gave up hope of being well. But when tragic things happen in your life, at some point, you need to let go of, the, of trying to find the answer to why. And I have moved to how did this happen? How did this happen in a family where his mental illness was discussed openly and dealt with honestly, and we could talk about anything, and we got help. We got, we did everything. We, how did this happen? And I've found a lot of answers, but one <clears throat> that I will share with you is that how it happened was because all of us don't know everything we need to know about mental illness. We don't know everything we need to know about taking care of our mental health, taking care of our brain, that important organ of our body that's responsible for everything from moods to regulating every aspect of our existence. Even professionals don't know everything we need to know about mental illness. And so I've arrived at, we're, we're, not, we're looking for um, a lot more progress in the area of mental health, but one thing we all can do is learn more. That's about education, that's about awareness. And so I'm really grateful for forums like this where we can share with you some of, of what we know, just a few things. The thing about my story is, though, it's not unique. My story, the story of losing a young person to suicide, repeats itself over and over again 
and an average of one every day in the state of Texas. Every day, on average, a young person in the state of Texas takes his or her own life. So this is a story that needs to be managed and dealt with because it's not an unusual story. Sadly, tragically, it's happening all the time here. Thank you, Vanita, for today. We're also joined by author Julie Hirsch, who authored her own story of mental illness and her journey back to hope. And the book is called Struck by Living, From Depression to Hope. Julie, share with us for a moment your story. Great, thank you so much, Benet, and thank you to UNT for having us here today. In September of 2001, when many of us in this country were watching two planes crash again and again into the Twin Towers, I sat in a locked psychiatric ward waiting for my first round of electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. I was certain my life was over. I was certain I had nothing to offer my friends or my family. And I was so certain of this that I drove a car into the garage and let the engine run for 90 minutes. Now luckily, unbeknownst to me, my garage happens to be very well ventilated. So I'm here today and I, you know, after I did ECT, the results were miraculous for me. Um, and it was almost as though I went in, had this treatment, and went from thinking that I was absolutely worthless and could never get better to suddenly looking at my life and thinking, gosh, I've got pr problems, but you know, I, I can make it through this. And so for me, that really crystallized that mental illness is a disease. And what's great is it's a disease that can be managed. What's interesting is my first depressive episode, knowing what I know now, happened my freshman year at the University of Notre Dame, which happens to so many people. If you think about what happens when you enter a college campus, you're suddenly removed from your support group of your home and the people who know you and know what's normal for you and what's abnormal for you. There's also things like happen that happen like alcohol, maybe drugs, that really throw the brain's function off its normal pace. And so what I've done is, um, with my alma mater, the University of Notre Dame, I actually came up with a list of things that I thought, gosh, if I could go back in time and do things differently, knowing what I do know now, what would I do? And some of these things are remarkably simple, like sleep. And there's tons of research on how effective sleep is to help you. Exercise, I'm an avid runner. When I look at when I had depressive episodes, almost all of them occurred when I was injured and I couldn't run. So we can talk about these other things later, but what I wanna offer to all of you is a message of hope that there's a lot of things that you can do just because you had even very serious mental illness, serious enough to try to take your own life, you can live a great life. And I'm, you know, we are both um, representative of that. I've had 13 fabulous years and been able to do things that I never dreamed I could have done. And all of that would have never happened if I had ended my life that day in the garage. Thank you. Julie, thank you so much for just reminding us that hope is possible. We're also joined today by Representative Garnet Coleman of the Houston District 147. He also has a personal story of mental illness, but what I love about what uh, Representative Coleman says is that mental illness does not define one's destiny. Tell us a little about that, Representative Coleman. Well, I, th I think it's very important, and it's been said that it's an illness. Um, and if people understand, like any other illness, it starts to sound trite, but we have to keep reminding people that this, there is no snap out of it. Uh, it requires uh, treatment professionals. It requires maintaining uh, the, the actual things that help you stay well um, and all within a real life. So uh, I can, I'll tell you right quickly, I, it, you know, I think 16, 17, just like a lot of people, it, it started to become very clear that I'd get depressed. And so what I would do is not go to school and sleep in the back of my car. Uh, and then when it 
the end of the day came, I'd go home. Um, but after I got elected to the legislature in the 90s, I left the house. I just left. Left my wife there. Left with the clothes on my back. Uh, and was gone for two different times, three months each. Uh, in hotels to isolate because of that feeling of worthlessness. Uh, you just don't want anybody around you. Uh, I've slept in a lot of closets. Um, and, you know, meaning that's the safest place I could get. The thing that I knew after those circumstances, that was 1994, was that if it ever happened again, I would not come out of it alive. Because I used up all these different ways of dealing with it, and that was the only thing left, was to take my own life. Uh, it was very good, because I got better treatment. Um, and, and I can say this now, that the, there, is, there are things that you can do. Uh, there are things that, that college students can do. You have the uh, mechanisms right here on this campus. Uh, and now it's even better because there are referrals to doctors and counseling programs and things that didn't exist when, when I was in college. Um, and, and, and that's something that if somebody's having a challenge, they should definitely take advantage of. But I, I kind of see it this way. Medication is important if one can't deal, their depression is continuing to be chronic, you know, over two or three days of, of, of you know, depressive mood, maybe longer than that. Most people go through two or three weeks, six months. Um, that's very clearly a problem for, for the person, but medication works. Um, also, exercise works. That is probably one of the best things that any individual can do to feel better and, and be healthy. Uh, because we're talking about brain chemicals. Um, and we, we know a little bit more about the, phys uh, the, the physical aspects of mental illness and that the brain can remap uh, based on uh, what's, what's going on with that individual. Uh, also, create a support group. And, and that support group uh, should be friends, family, uh, and, and the like, and find people who will tell you you're full of it. Uh, and that you, you're whining when you're really whining, and then find people who affirm you and say you're the best person in the world. You, you're better than anybody, because people need that. Um, and continue doing that, that through, through your time. Sometimes it's difficult to find people who will play that role. But it, it's, I think it's becoming even more important. The last thing I'll add to this story, I suppose, is recent circumstances, and I, I think it's important to add that because the, the challenge with medication is it fails. Now, y'all may not know this. You've heard about cocktails for HIV, right? And then they started doing the combo pills. All y'all know about it. Boy, you may know about that. Um, the thing about antidepressants and uh, other medications that deal with bipolar disorder or whatever else it is, People are better because they're taking two or three different medications. So I, I take uh, three, three different medications. And I've you know, been fine adjusting them for you know, the last 10 years until probably about February of this year. Um, and I hadn't felt like that in, in so long. I, I didn't even really, I couldn't, you know. But I was back to that not leaving uh, the house, uh, you know, it, it affect, my diabetes affected it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you this today, because of the depression and the diabetes, people keep saying, well, you lost a lot of weight. Well, I've gained back weight. I got down to 132 pounds because of not, I just didn't eat. And these are when things become comorbid, as they say, they affect each other. Um, 
I can tell you, I just told my mother this. She said, well, well, how are you doing? I said, I'm as good as the medication works, and when it fails, I'm not going to be good. And the, the worst part of it is that's absolutely true. Uh, so I, I'll leave it at that, but don't worry. In, since 1995, I've only had medication fail three times, and I'm 52 years old. So if there, there is there is management of the illness. You don't even think about it once you get to that point. Well, Representative Coleman, you are absolutely the story of continuing the journey. And, and I think that's an important message for people to understand about mental illness. It is a journey um, that goes through ebbs and flows, and really that support system is really key at every level of that, whether that's family, friends, um, students that you don't even know, opportunities to talk to you, a crisis line, which we'll talk about a little bit more later as well. But we just want to remind you and stop here for a moment that these are all stories of hope. Um, even though they are stories that seem challenging, they're still all stories of hope. But we also want to talk about the legislative part of this because that's really important. And it's important to know for all of you that Texas is near and pretty close to the bottom in terms of provision of mental health funding in our state. And so, you know, Representative Coleman, tell us a little bit about what's changing with that and what you hope to see uh, in the next le legislative session as we've just ended this recent one. Well, people react to a lot of things and try to find uh, a silver bullet that the public will accept. Uh, and you've heard the debates over guns, guns on college campuses, you know, all that. Um, and people who didn't want to deal with guns chose to fund mental health uh, treatment. And I think that's fine. Um, y you know, it it's important. So we put in probably about $350 million in the budget. Uh, and I passed several bills, with one with Dr. Duell from up here, that advances some legislation I passed in the last session that deals with intervention uh, for students starting in high school and training of teachers to see what, uh, when, a, when a child is, is, has different behavior and to make that referral to the parents is extremely important. Uh, we were talking, called the people up here, the edu education, um, regional education center. They said that the legislation that I passed in, um, what, what year was that? 2011 is actually working. The problem they have is, and then we've added to it, the problem they have is that there are still many suicides in rural areas. Um, but now that the, it's a required uh, teacher training, school training, and all of that, I think, I think that, that we can make some progress. Um, and maybe we can catch some folks who are a harm to themselves or others. The thing that should happen next session, okay, we've done all this. Um, you know, our, my committee recommended uh, our interim study, the Haven for Hope deal. I mean, we've been doing diversion. I passed mental health court. I, mean, I could go through my, the litany of bills uh, that I've passed. But when I was serving on appropriations, we had gotten to 43rd in funding. We weren't 49th, we were 43rd in going up. And then in one session in 2003, we dropped to 50th. And once money drops, very hard to put, put back. Because y'all don't want to pay taxes, right? And because of that, to deal with the overall population of a state of 27 million people, it takes a lot of money. Well, fortunately, the state of Texas did this 1115 transformation waiver. Just, just, let me just put it this way. We've asked the federal government to allow, to match some funds that we have uh, in order to do projects around the state uh, that deal with diverting people really from hospitals. Um, and mental health is, are 35% of the projects uh, across the state. And that's because we had never matched uh, the outpatient dollars uh, in the, the centers and MHMRAs. And these are things that, that 
you know, I was forced in, and this was not this session, it was the previous session. Uh, but, but it's gonna make a difference. Uh, so the last thing I guess I would leave you with is, don't look at what people do today, look at what they do tomorrow. And if that money doesn't stay, that means it wasn't real anyway. Well, we're glad to hear that. And that's next session. Well, we're glad to hear there's some opportunity in the next session and really some responsibility for those of us uh, to actually continue pushing for uh, the continuation of that funding. And, and speaking of 1115 projects, we're joined today as well by Pamela Gutierrez. Uh, who is the executive director of the Denton County MHMR. You shared with me earlier, you've been with them 20 plus years and just really have a great understanding of the need in the Denton County area and then a little bit about the project that you all are looking at working on. Thank you very much for having me and um, helping to reduce the stigma. It's so important to our community. Denton actually um, is dead last as far as funding of all of the 39 community centers with the um, appropriations that were just given to us, now we're eighth from the bottom. We are able to take 300 people off our wait list with that funding. That's the first time ever that we've been able to do that. We have a unbelievable crisis program. Anyone can get services 24 hours a day. That was developed in 2007. However, where do you go then? You're in crisis, so you go back into crisis because that's the only means that you'll get services. So it's, it's a wonderful thing, but it's so important that it continues because I don't know where the folks will go and, and we're the safety net. If you all need us, if you know people that need us, 24 hours a day you can call us and we'll come to you. Our crisis services can extend up to three months and then you can come back in to crisis services. So it truly is a wonderful thing. And at this point, we'll be able to re reduce our wait list. But as Representative Coleman said, um, it's gonna grow. Um, people are coming in every day. So if the attention isn't paid to it, it will be back up to 300 in no time. Well, we're looking forward to you all being able to increase your services. And again, just reminding all of us that we need to really be vigilant about ensuring that our legislators know how important it is that that funding stays available, especially for a county that is really needing those services like Denton um, and has such great folks doing the work. We are also joined today, um, I did not mention, but Pam is a UNT alum as well as one of our other panelists, Amy Stewart, who is the Chief Program Officer for Contact, uh, the crisis line that I also serve with. And Amy, one of the things that we are noticing for uh, the mental health community is that there are some challenges in just collaboration, how providers work together, but really the increase of the issue and the need is also an impact on all of us as providers. Sure, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be back in my old stomping grounds. I loved being at UNT and I love being back today. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our involvement with students, but uh, really funding is a huge issue, access to care, adequate access to care. If there's no money, then we're really limited as to what we can provide. Contact is a grassroots organization that has been in the Dallas community for 46 years. Uh, we find ourselves really kind of closing the gap as best we can. Uh, while you might think of us as a traditional suicide hotline, we also talk to callers with all types of issues. Uh, suicide calls really represent about 7% of our call volume. 30% of callers are presenting with some type of mental illness, which is very substantial. And a lot of them tell us that they don't have access to care, either they don't have insurance, they're underinsured, they don't have transportation. Transportation is a huge problem in our, in our community. Uh, but along with lack of funding, it's kind of where you all come in. Uh, along with the lack of funding comes, we don't have enough professionals to deal with the issues uh, of mental illness. Hopefully, with mental health funding increasing, the field will look uh, appealing to those of you who are going into the field, but mental health is a viable option for you all as students if it's something that you're interested in. It's part of our plan as a state 
to look at recruiting and placing qualified professionals into roles so that people are getting the quality care that they need. In Dallas, Benet was saying that, that that continuity of care, that's another thing that I think is a big issue. There's not a lot of conversation across organizations and agencies. And part of that is due to HIPAA and, and laws, privacy laws, which are important, but they can also be constraining. Uh, I know that I talk to people on the crisis lines. They tell me, well, I have a caseworker here, a caseworker here, a physician here, and nobody's talking to each other. So they get fragmented care and, and no continuity. Uh, the Dallas community is really looking at ways of bridging those gaps. They're meeting regularly, uh, and they have been for three years now, to try to talk about those gaps and how can we communicate better, how can we share data that is relevant and is uh, n not going to hurt somebody's privacy. So I think that those are, you know, funding and quality and uh, continuity of services are probably some real top issues. Well, and I know one of the issues as well that we, we talk about, we hear more about, um, almost everybody on this panel I'm sure at some point has talked about, is the issue of erasing stigma around mental illness and really changing and stemming the tide for what comes next when we're talking about getting people the help they need in a way that is socially acceptable. Benita, do you want to weigh in a little bit on that? I do. <clears throat> the Grant Halliburton Foundation is totally focused on one thing, and that is teen and young adult mental health and suicide prevention. And we believe that if people only knew uh, the signs of a person in distress or knowing when yourself, you yourself are in some uh, uh, tough times, rough waters emotionally, if they knew those signs and they knew the signs of a person who's in suicidal crisis, so much could be done um, earlier rather than later or, or even when it's too late after a tragedy has occurred. We have a program called Tag Your It where we train people, including um, students, uh, faculty, parents, community groups. Everyone needs to know the signs of suicidal crisis in a person. Tag stands for take it seriously, ask questions, get help, contact with similar programs where they go into schools and talk to groups everywhere. I, I really believe education and awareness is the key to um, doing something about this because like many things in uh, society, nothing happens until people start talking. Minds are not changed until people start talking about a taboo topic. Suicide, mental illness has been taboo for too long. And I believe this is the generation that will change that, that will bring it out into the open and say, it e should be as easy to say, I need help, I need psychological help, as it is to say, I've pulled a muscle and I need to go to the doctor. That is the simple truth of it. Thank you. And Julie, I know too that you have thought about this and then we want to give each of you an opportunity to give the students and the faculty here today one thing you want to take away with but Julie I want to hear with, from you a little bit about what you think on this issue of stigma. Well I, I think one of the things that happens is because we focus so much on illness as opposed to health we we end up being in a reactive mode instead of um, solving problems. There was a, a person um, who once believed that you needed to wash hands before surgery. And this person was basically laughed out of every medical facility. He ended up in an insane asylum by the end of his life. Um, then we came around in our medical community to understand that if people did simple things like washing their hands, you could do amazing things in prevention of disease. I really think we're missing the boat a lot on mental health that not just the sick people need to understand about brain health, everybody in this room needs to think about their mental health. You need to think about sleep, exercise, nutrition, support groups, and granted, there will be some people in this room that are genetically more prone to men mental illness than others, just the way some people will be more prone to heart disease. But until we stop looking at people who are mentally ill as the aliens or the strange people over there and until we all start thinking about brain health and that we all need to take care of our brains I think we're gonna we'll continue to be in this reactive mode so we need to get to the point where it's okay to say 
yes, I'm having these symptoms and go out and get help early. Thank you. And as we wrap up for our guest here on the panel and on the stage, we just want to remind you, they will be staying around uh, so that you have opportunities to speak with them one on one. But Pam, I want to start with you. If you're talking to this community that you serve, what is the one takeaway that you want these students to know? And then we'll just move very quickly down the line. I think the most important thing is to talk about suicide, talk about your feelings. I think so many times, um, as the panel has said, it, 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 it's such a stigma and it's not talked about. And if you talk to each other and you help each other, you're giving each other hope. And we're there for you. If you need the help, we're there. Thank you. A uh, Couple of things. Uh, those of you who are on your parents' insurance while you're here at school, raise your hand. But thank Obamacare for that. If you're on your parents' insurance and under the requirements of the Affordable Care Act, uh, mental health is part of the package. So before, there was a different model. Now, if you have your insurance card, that pre-existing condition uh, has to be treated. That's extremely important because the, part of the problem we have is that people don't have the money to go get care. So that's a real, interesting thing. If we had done the Medicaid expansion, some of you all have heard about that, uh, every person, just about every person who is served by an MHMRA would have been covered with their own health insurance in their pocket for their mental illness. Uh, so I, I, I kind of, I want to leave you with, there are answers, but, and the solutions have been around, but it takes people to move in a direction where the, the public and the policy makers say this is something we need to do. Uh, so that's something that is really good for you because the 26 year old deal is Obamacare. Pre-existing conditions, Obamacare. All of these things are, are, are brought to you by uh, Obamacare. Also, those of you who are over uh, 26. The, the, the marketplace is open on uh, Tuesday, I think it is, or Wednesday, whatever day it is. It's really inexpensive for young people to get insurance under the marketplaces if you age out of your parents' coverage. And, and so I would encourage you, and I'm sure the school probably requires you have insurance anyway, but look at the value of that insurance and get insurance for not what you need now, but for what you don't know you'll need later. Wonderful, thank you. Julie? My message to you would be, it is easier to maintain mental health than it is to recover from mental illness. So don't wait until you have symptoms of mental illness to take action to protect your brain. Think about sleep exercise, nutrition, think about stress and doing things like meditation or yoga to eliminate stress. Think about social support groups. Um, I have a lot of information about these kinds of things on my website, struckbyliving.com, um, and I'd be happy to share that information with anybody here. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Benita? I have two things. One is get yourself informed about what the symptoms of mental illness look like so that you can help a friend or help yourself when you need it. We have brochures for you back at our table, which is right there. Uh, one's called How to Save a Life, Warning Signs of Someone Thinking About Suicide and How to Have the Conversation with Them, and the other is about recognizing depression. And the second thing is being able to talk to someone to open this subject is so important and it can start with a simple phrase, are you okay? Don't think that this is something that only doctors and professionals should deal with. You can really make an impact in a person's life by just opening the door and saying, you can talk to me about how you feel, and I'll help you find what you need. Absolutely. Thank you, Vanita. Amy, you want to close this out? Yeah, I want to expand on what Vanita said. I, I would say care for one another. Uh, if you saw someone who was passed out and perhaps having a heart attack, you would do what you could to get that person help. That doesn't mean that you have to fix the situation or, or do something that you don't feel qualified to do, 
but get involved and, and like Benita said, find out what you need to know about mental health, mental illness, uh, and also get involved in your community. Because of a lack of funding, a lot of nonprofit agencies rely on volunteers to provide the services. Uh, we work almost solely with volunteers. We have 130 volunteers that answer our crisis lines 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They are highly trained, we support them, but they are there tirelessly helping individuals, uh, it, not just in the Dallas community, but I, I was telling the panelists that Denton County, we serve uh, Denton County residents, it's the third largest population for us. So. Uh, if you're interested in our agency, we're back there in the red with Sierra, who is a UNT student. <laughs> uh, but also get involved in your, your local agencies that provide services. We want to thank all of our panelists. You all have been great, and we just appreciate you sharing your personal stories, your passion for this issue, and just really giving all of you as students an opportunity to take some information away for your own personal life, health, and your future. I want to thank UNT for allowing me to moderate today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Evenson for serving on the contact board and, and thinking of engaging us, and Tina and her team as well. So I'll turn things back over to you. Tom? Thanks, Benet. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking as this panel was, was talking, um, if you're really, really smart, you'll stay in school for a long, long time and come to these things each single year because they're, they're all good. There's always topics that, are, that are, are make you, I want to do that. I want to do something about sex trafficking. I want to do something about hunger. I want to do something about mental illness. All of those things, that hopefully that's the kind of effect. I want to do all of those things and I'm not going to be around that much longer. So I suppose uh, I'm going to have to get busy, but you are. So. Um, there's a lot of interesting things. I've got about uh, uh, just a few seconds, and I've uh, been asked to uh, make uh, several comments. Um, first of all, I want to thank the panel. This is a great panel, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, this is outstanding group. The other thing is um, evaluations. We need your evaluations. We need some feedback. We, you know, we don't pretend that we know everything around here. And uh, what, what do you think? And you're going to be getting something in an email uh, uh, early next week asking you for a little feedback and giving, you, uh, giving us your comments. And just as an incentive, there's, there's going to be some drawings for somebody that uh, a couple people that do their evaluations. You might when uh, I don't think it's a car this year, but it's a, it, it, you'll get something out of it. So evaluations at any rate, do, do we, we really value those. The resource fair, ch be curious, check around, walk around, look at what the, uh, the, uh, our, our guests have. There are so many ways to get involved. Denton is one of the coolest communities in the state. There are so many opportunities to participate. And, uh, and you have an opportunity to look at some of, the, uh, some of the options that you have. So visit with some of the people sitting at the tables, uh, check that out. Another thing is that if something sparked in your head when you were listening to this or sparks in your head at any time is I wanna do something. I think I, I can have an impact on a problem. PAX has a, what we, re, what we call our community renewal fund and it's for students. It's for students working with faculty, working with community partners to get in and, and give you some money to support getting started on something, it's like a mini grant, so to speak, where you have, your, some of the best ideas are sitting in these chairs, or people sitting in these chairs right here. People, that, ideas that nobody's ever thought of. That is an opportunity, check that out on our website, on the PAX website, and see if you, can, if you want to put something together, be a little entrepreneurial, not in the business world, although you're welcome to do that too, but in the, uh, in the nonprofit world, in the, world that we're we've been talking about today. There are so many different opportunities, but I want to, uh, for, for uh, volunteering and for doing something. And that's, that's uh, I like what Julie said, get, get sleep, get nutrition, do exercise, be of relevance to somebody, be important to somebody, and volunteering is a, is a good way of doing that. One uh, uh, opportunity that we have in Denton, this is another cool Denton thing, we're looking for 10,000 mentors in Denton. They don't all have to come from universities or from public schools. We're looking for anybody that wants to mentor. They're, now we're emphasizing 
youngsters in schools. 10,000 kids in our dent schools need some kind of support. They're at risk at not making it in school, not making it to where you are. And you got into a, a really good university. They may not get into it. They may not even get out of high school. One person, one hour a week for one year is what we're looking for with this 10,000. We're looking for 10,000 mentors. All you need to do, it's very simple. There's a recipe. You take out your cell phone. You type in uh, mentordenton.org. That'll come up on the screen. You can fill out an application. Very simple, very short. They'll get back to you, and they'll show you, uh, give you some opportunities on how you can volunteer. Make that, that's something you can add to your year and make this a, a year, besides good academic experience, good times in uh, UNT, you can uh, have some memories because of what you did for somebody else. And uh, finally, one of the things that, one of the tables here is the um, uh, uh, table for nonprofit leadership, uh, UNT's uh, organization. If you're interested in nonprofit, and in nonprofit administration and nonprofit organizations, check that that particular group out. That's a U student group that is working with with uh, United Ways in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Denton. They're they're on the move, and there's a, that's a connect with some people and that have interests similar to yours. That's another one you can check out. Now, finally, there's always several finallys when I'm talking, but this is the last one. Um, lunch. There's lunch for you over here. Hang around. We've got, we, we always have questions for panelists and never enough time, but these guys are going to be around for a while. Say hello to them. Let them know what, uh, um, uh, what you're interested in. And if you really liked what they had to say, then um, y your instructors, so many of your, your faculty are here. Tell them you'd like to bring that person up here and talk for a whole class period or have a special event or something like that if you're really interested in, in uh, uh, the issues that we're talking about today. You have that kind of power as a student and that kind of influence. We want you to learn what you need to learn and uh, what you're interested in. So we have a look in your lunch packets. There are, uh, there's a ticket in for 60 of you, not all of you, but 60 of you to get a, uh, a book, uh, one of Julie Hirsch's books, a copy of it. And she's here, so I'm sure she'd sign it. So she, see, uh, the books are here. See if you can't walk out of here with, uh, I know everybody came hoping they'd get more to read. And, uh, uh, but but uh, this is a good book that you, you uh, it, it's a great book that she wrote. So maybe you have a shot at that. So go ahead. Thank you very, very much for coming today. We'll look forward to your evaluations and what we want to do next year. Thank you.